Hello. On behalf of the Churches of Christ, and Christ's Way Bible Institute, we welcome you to the rebroadcast of our Monday morning class. It is our desire to assist all who are interested in various Bible, and New Testament doctrines and teachings. We set as a goal one online class each Monday morning. Information and links to the live meeting can be found on our website. www. The Churches of Christ. Life. On the live meetings page. May God bless your studies in His Word. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we begin our class today by giving thanks. Lord, your love and endures for and our, never fails. Though there are many ways in which we have failed, we thank you for revealing yourself to us through your word. As we begin our Bible discussion with Brother Brian Barrett today, please give knowledge and wisdom to learn more from your Father. We are opening our hands to hearts and mind. Receive your word. May the Lord transform into your likeness. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Before we go to class, let us sing him and glorify the Lord's name. It was a familiar chorus. You know that in his time, in his time. In his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful. In his time, Lord, please show me every day. Yes, you're teaching me your way. That you do just what you say in your time, in your time, in your time. You make all things beautiful in your time. Lord, my life to you I bring. May it song I have to sing be to you a lovely thing in your time. Okay. May the Lord bless our studies. Now, this is our opportunity, Brother Brian Barrett with us. Uh, past a few weeks, we are discussing under the redemption in various, talk, various topics. Today, our topic is preparation for redemption. Now, I request Brother Brian Barrett, we warmly welcome you to Teach the word of God. Morning. Good morning. Happy New Year. God bless you. First time in this That's new right. year that we've had the opportunity to uh, assemble, and I'm so glad. Uh, I apologize. Last week uh, we weren't able to have the meeting. One of my family members uh, had passed away, and so her funeral was last week, but. Uh, you know, she was a Christian, and, and we praise God for her decision uh, many years ago. And so today, you know, that's part of what we're talking about, redemption. You know, salvation and the things that we're talking about, while they benefit us in this life, they prepare us for the life which is yet to come. And so that's the part that we want to look at, and that's the part that we're studying. Uh, if you haven't downloaded the study guide, I would encourage you to do that. It's on our website. If you need help with that or finding it, uh, send uh, Brother Stanley an email or uh, contact uh, me, and we will help you get that. Uh, today, we're in lesson six of our study about redemption, and the lesson is about preparations for redemption. We've been talking about in previous lessons the fact that uh, the Old Testament prophets had prophesied some 351 different prophecies or more in the Old Testament that allows us to have an insight into that more sure word of prophecy as it is fulfilled in the New Testament, and to see just how much preparation God indeed made 
uh, for us to be able to uh, understand what he's done for us and the plans that he's made. In our study guide, one of the first verses that we see there is John 1 verse 29, talking about John the Baptist when he was with some of his disciples and he saw Jesus coming. And his statement is, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And so that's what Jesus was. John accurately portrays that when he says that he is the Lamb, the sacrificial Lamb, uh, the Passover Lamb, if we understand it correctly. For you who uh, have been around a while, Jesus was truly the Passover Lamb. He sacrificed his blood on the cross of Calvary, just like the Passover lamb so uh, many years ago. Uh, the Hebrews put the blood of the lamb of the Passover on the doorposts, and when God saw the blood, he passed over. And that's the way it is with us today in God's redemption and God's plan of redemption. When we are obedient to the gospel, then God adds us to his church and we are covered by the blood of that sacrificial lamb, Jesus Christ. And so God, just like in ancient times, uh, when he got to the, uh, the children of Israel, he didn't look through the door. He only looked to see the blood. And there's a great lesson in that for us today. Inside our lives are many things that still need improvement. But thanks be to God, he does not look at every flaw. But when he sees the blood of Christ, he passes over. And that's how we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. One of the passages that I want to look at this morning, and we're not necessarily going to look at every thing that's in, uh, some of it's rather simple, it's in today's lesson, but I want to look at some important parts talking about how God prepared and how it, it was planned out and some of those plans, how they come to fruition and blessed us so that we have the opportunity today uh, for the salvation of sins. If you would, turn with us, if you're following today, to the book of Galatians, chapter 4, and we're going to read uh, from verse uh, 4 through verse 7. Paul, writing to the church there, says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you're sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 8 that we are joint heirs with Christ. What a great blessing. What a great thought that we have received redemption through Jesus Christ. And not only are we redeemed, but we have received adoption whereby we can call uh, God our Father. And that term Abba is an Aramaic Phrase, and it is a phrase that is used uh, for a very close relationship. A child uses that term for its father. Uh, it's not a term that is used just for anyone. And so Paul is telling us that we have a very dear and close relationship with God. He has adopted us, and therefore we are the sons and the daughters of God. And this is what redemption is all about, becoming uh, something that we have no power to be of our own. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and God prepared a way for us to be redeemed. 
And part of that preparation we want to talk about today, uh, and one of the things that we see here in this particular verse is in verse 4, it says, when the fullness of the time was come. In the book of John, there is an interesting statement Jesus makes on many occasions. He, speaking to his mother, speaking to his disciples, speaking to others, says, my time is not yet come. And that phrase is repeated several times in the book of John, up until the time that he says, my time has come. God had to the minute plan the things that took place with our redemption and with Jesus. We need to understand that none of this is an accident. Many uh, theologians today view what God did as an accident. The gospel of Christ to them is merely an accident or a substitute for what God had planned. That's false theology because God clearly tells us uh, through the Apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit, that at the appropriate time, at the exact time that things needed to be, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. Now we've talked about in previous lessons, going back to Genesis chapter 3, and verse 14, the prophecy that Jesus would come as the seed of a woman. And the seed of the woman would bruise or crush the head of Satan, would defeat his power. And that defeat is our redemption, who were a lifetime subject to bondage, have been freed through the sacrifice of Jesus. Let's talk about for a moment this statement about the fullness of time. I'm sure some of you have read in the book of Daniel, the, the uh, second chapter, and that's where we're going to go to this morning for a little while, because uh, in the second chapter, we have a vision that Nebuchadnezzar had of this great image, and it troubled him as to what the meaning of those things were. Daniel comes and he uh, to the king, and he begins to interpret the, ki the, uh, the king's vision. And it's very important for us. It wasn't just a vision uh, for the king, but it's also part of the preparations and the fullness of time that the Apostle Paul speaks of. Uh, when we look into the, the Bible that we presently have, we find that the last book of the Old Testament is the prophet Malachi. Malachi was written over 400 years, between four and 500 years before Jesus came. And so there is a break in the Bible uh, from Malachi to Matthew of over 400 years. Those are not silent years. Sometimes people call them the silent years, but they were very active years, and it applies to what we see here in the book of Daniel. Let's read that, and, and we'll make some comments. Uh, when Daniel was interpreting the dream in Daniel 2, beginning in verse 31, he says, Thou, O king, sawest, behold, a great image, the great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold, broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff to the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. 
and the stone that smote the image become a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, if you've studied this to some degree, you know where I'm going. If you haven't, we're going to discuss it a little bit this morning because these things are important in those years that we're talking about and part of the special preparations that God made. We can read about the prophecies, but we also need to know what was going on from the time of Malachi until the time uh, of Matthew, some of the events, how they uh, unfolded in this preparation to show what God was doing. So when Paul says the fullness of times, he truly is accurate in that statement. So as he begins to interpret this, uh, and as we see this, uh, he starts uh, talking about that. Uh, and so he starts in verse 36 with the interpretation 37. He says, Thou, O king, that is the Babylonian king, art a king of kings, for God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the fowls of heaven, hath he given into thy hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. In the Old Testament, one of the things, uh, the closing part uh, we see is the fact that uh, Assyria, which is not Babylon, but Assyria previous to this, had carried away the northern tribes of Israel, and they were diversely spread about the earth. And they today are called the ten lost tribes of Israel because they were lost. Then later Nebuchadnezzar, and the Babylonian king, came and took the southern kingdom of Judah. And part of this is that through the rule of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the uh, Jewish people were preserved. The teachings of the Jewish people were preserved until such time as they returned from those 70 years of captivity. And so the beginning of this was the Babylonian Empire. And so he talks about that. Uh, and it says, After thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. This, of course, was the kingdom of the Medes and Persians. Many people call it the Medo-Persian Empire. This was the empire that was in power uh, when Esther, uh, Queen Esther, was written. And so it was the Persians who uh, helped to get the children of Israel back into the promised land. So. Babylon carried them away and preserved the teachings and the doctrines and the things of Israel, sustained the seed of hope of the Messiah, helped to develop and to build that while they were in the captivity. And then the Medo-Persians sent uh, the Jews back into the land. And so uh, they helped to reestablish the children of Israel uh, in the land that today we know, uh, uh, we think of as Judah and Galilee. And then it says after that, there would be another kingdom, a third kingdom. And this third kingdom was the Greeks. Uh, this third kingdom that is described here is interesting in God's plan. Babylon, as we said, was used as a punishment for Israel, but also preserved uh, the teachings and preserved the seed line of Jesus. And the Medo-Persian Empire helped to sustain that and to bring it back into the land of Israel. Now, it's interesting that the Greeks, as part of God's plan of the fullness of time, uh, several things happened. One, through the Greek Empire, there was one universal language that was introduced to the people, and that is the Greek language. 
And in Jesus' day, the, the language most commonly used, even under the Romans, was still Greek language, Koine Greek. The common person's Greek was spoken and understood by most of the world. And so this third kingdom gave the world a, if you want to call it, a universal uh, language. And in addition to that, during the time of the Greeks and the Greek influence, a decision was made to translate the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. And we call that copy the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Old Testament's Hebrew translated into Greek. And so this allowed more people to be able to read and to know about who the Hebrews were and the promises made and the prophecies that were there. And so the Greeks gave us language, uh, a universal language, a way of communicating, and they gave us a copy of the Old Testament in a language that the people of the time could understand. And this is all moving us closer to what Paul says is the fullness of time. So Babylon captures, preserves, the Medes bring them back, the Greeks translate uh, the Bible into their language, and they give the world a universal language. And then after this third kingdom, we're told in verse 40, the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. And we know what that fourth kingdom was. That is the kingdom of the Roman Empire. During the time of the intertestament period, after Malachi and before Matthew, was the rise and fall of the Greeks and the coming of the Romans uh, in taking over this empire that the Greeks once had. And so with the Romans came uh, the idea of a universal citizenship, uh, a belonging to the empire, and with that, some of the things the Romans were very good at were constructing roads and providing protection uh, to many travelers. And so uh, under the Roman Empire, uh, travelers were at a certain degree of protection. They had good roads, uh, good transportation systems. The Romans were interested in, in those things. And so Daniel says that during the time of this fourth kingdom would rise another kingdom. Uh, and so uh, it tells us in verse 44, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. And we're talking about the kingdom of God. We're talking about the church that Jesus established in the days of those kings, Acts 2. Uh, we see on the day of Pentecost following Jesus' crucifixion, Peter stands up and he preaches about uh, various prophecies that were fulfilled, especially the prophecies to David uh, that the Messiah, as Peter describes it, would not just be dead and buried, but uh, in the course of time, he his soul would not be left in the Hadean realm, but that he would resurrect. And so all these things were planned. And so uh, when we talk about preparation, starting in uh, before the foundation of the world, as we've already seen, God was making plans uh, for the salvation of mankind. And all throughout the Old Testament, we see that in those 400 years, God was still making preparations 
for the coming of Jesus. And so when the fullness of time was come, when everything uh, was right as it needed to be to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to as many people as possible, it was done. And through the agency and the power, we see the Apostle Paul going from city to city, town to town. Uh, many parts of the world had access uh, to these Greek writings, the Septuagint. And so the Apostle Paul could go into a synagogue in any part of the world, and he could request either uh, the Hebrew scrolls or he could request the Greek scrolls, whichever the case may be, and he could unroll those scrolls, those writings, and he could begin uh, at any particular place and preach unto them Jesus, as we see taking place in the book of Acts. And so the scene was set to bring the gospel to the Jew first, and then as we see in Acts 10, to the Gentiles only, as it's brought into the household of Cornelius, and all the world is brought together under the banner of Christ, under the church that he established, and under a name given to everyone, which is Christian. This is an amazing thing that we read about in the scriptures and think about as part of God's plan in accomplishing uh, those principles. Point three in our outline today uh, speaks about some of the, what I would call types and shadows, what the book of Hebrews calls types and shadows, things that took place in the Old Testament, kind of preparing our minds. Uh, and some of the things that it mentions in there uh, is that under the law of, of Moses, there was the idea of blood atonement. That was that when we sin, there must be a sacrifice. There must be something that sets that right. Now, Hebrews 10 tells us it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. But the sacrifices under the Old Testament were used to get people to understand the need of atonement and being faithful to God and his commandments. And so in the book of Hebrews chapter 9, we find the blood of Jesus Christ and his atonement not only atones for those under the New Testament, the New Covenant, but that blood also atones for the sins of those who were under the first testament, the first covenant, all the way back to the sins of Adam and Eve, those who were faithful uh, in offering up their sacrifices and doing either what was required under the patriarchal period or what was required uh, under the time of Moses. And so we have that. We have uh, the idea of the temple, a holy place where God dwells. In the Old Testament, uh, ultimately it was Jerusalem. But as Jesus tells the woman of Samaria, uh, there was a time coming that neither in that mountain in Samaria nor in Jerusalem would be the place where people worship. That God was a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And we see that Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew chapter 18, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. And so uh, when we see uh, in the, the New Testament and the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, talks about the Christian as being the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwells in you. We are that holy temple. And so wherever the people of God go, wherever the people assemble and meet, there is the holy dwelling place of God. God dwells with his people. He made preparations uh, for us to understand that and to be able uh, 
uh, to understand worship. And in the Old Testament, part of what those preparations with Israel was, uh, was worship. Jesus had an issue in the book of Matthew chapter 15 uh, with those people who were worshiping uh, them in vain, teaching for commandments, the doctrines of men. One of the things about worship is that under the Old Testament, we were instructed how we were to worship And the example we have of Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, is when we add to or take away from the worship of God what he's commanded, it is a very dangerous thing. And they were stricken with fire and and killed because they did not follow the instructions which was given. And that became an example to the children of Israel, becomes an example to us today, that when we're going to worship God, we're going to worship him in spirit and in truth. There was a day of atonement. The children of Israel looked for a specific day in the year that atonement would take place. Well, now, thanks be to God, that day of atonement has already taken place. The day of atonement for us was the day that Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. Uh, And in his sacrifice there, there was made a propitiation or an atonement for sin that John speaks of in 1 John chapter 2, and verse 1. Part of the uh, teachings of the day of atonement was also the scapegoat. There were two goats. One was sacrificed and the blood was offered. And another one, the priest symbolically laid his hands on the head of the scapegoat and imparted uh, to that goat all the sins of Israel. And that goat was led out into the wilderness and turned loose. The idea being that the sins of of us, of mankind, were gone and they uh, were not to be had again. And that's one of the things that happens when our, uh, our sins are forgiven under the blood of Christ. We uh, receive atonement, we receive remission of sins. As Peter says in Acts 2, uh, there when they ask what we can do, he says, repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Very powerful statement because that day, was offered to them through the blood of Christ, the remission of sin, true and lasting forgiveness for the sins of the world. Now, in our our lesson outline, we can see uh, some things uh, that are mentioned there in point four. Uh, In Luke 1, verses 5 through 25, Uh, We find the birth of Jesus uh, talked about. We also see the birth of John the Baptist, who was a forerunner uh, for Christ. In the closing uh, chapter of the book of Malachi, it talks about that God would send back the prophet Elijah before the day of the Lord, and he would turn the hearts of the people back to the fathers. This is a prophecy concerning John the Baptist fulfilled in John. John was not the literal Elijah, but he came in the fashion of Elijah, a prophet of God, prophet of God in the wilderness, crying, you know, make straight the path for the Lord. And John began to prepare the way of the Lord. John came teaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, that they should believe on him uh, that would come afterwards. And so uh, we have that uh, opportunity to uh, believe. A little bit further in there, uh, in Luke, uh, talks about uh, Jesus, uh, the angel, Matthew 1, verse uh, 21, and, and also earlier in that chapter, gives us two names. It gives us both the name Jesus, which is uh, the New Testament. We've talked about this in other lessons, but the uh, 
the New Testament name Jesus is the same name as the Old Testament name Joshua. And so uh, Jesus was actually Joshua, or would have been Joshua under the Old Testament. That's his name. And the name Joshua means God saves. And so the name which was given, even and announced before his birth, was that he would be called Jesus, and he would save his people from their sins. We also have the name Emmanuel, which is by interpretation, uh, God with us. And so with those two names, we find that God was with us in the flesh, and in his sacrifice, he saved not only his people, the Jews, but his people, the nations, having been, as John tells us in John 1, the part of the Godhead that was in our creation in the beginning. That's Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, uh, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that God became flesh and dwelt amongst us, John says. And in Matthew 1, uh, we're given the name Emmanuel. And then John the Baptist, as we've read earlier, speaks of Jesus as a Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the whole world. And so God will save uh, through him. And so there were various announcements concerning Jesus to both Jews and to the nations. Uh, one of the so-called Christmas stories that many people uh, deal with is the story of the wise men who came to Jesus, who came from the east over in the area of the old Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, these were the Magi, and they were wise men who uh, understood the prophecies concerning the coming king. And I'm sure part of that comes from the time that the Israelites were there uh, in the, uh, the nation of the Medo-Persian Empire. And so the hope of a Messiah was not just for the Jew, but many of the nations also uh, were looking forward to that. We see Cornelius uh, and his household uh, were preparing themselves, praying and hoping uh, for the salvation that would come from God. When we uh, look uh, we see that uh, in first or in John chapter one, verse twenty nine, as we've already stated, Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God. But John also says in John one and thirty that Jesus was before John. Now it's estimated that John was probably somewhere in the area of uh, six months older than Jesus. And the birth of John the Baptist was before the birth of Jesus. But John the Baptist knows that Jesus was before him because he existed with God and he was God. And then, of course, the Holy Spirit's working with Jesus. John speaks about the uh, sign given to him by God that uh, the, who the Messiah would be, the one whom he baptized. And when he was baptized, he saw the Spirit coming upon him and stay. This would be the Messiah. And John bears record that he saw these things. Matthew records the baptism of Jesus, that uh, the voice of God was heard. This is my beloved Son in whom... I'm well pleased. And so Jesus uh, was making final preparations, if you want to call it that. In the book of uh, Matthew, we see in Matthew 3 there at his baptism, 
uh, he did that to fulfill all righteousness and to prepare himself and his life. He was led out into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan and he overcame temptation himself. He was subjected to various types. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And the devil eventually left him and went away. And Jesus began his public ministry. And for three, three and a half years, Jesus went through the area of Galilee, Samaria, and Judea, preaching and teaching uh, about the coming kingdom. And of course, after his uh, sacrifice on the cross, you know, his time, as we said earlier, throughout the book of John, we'll hear Jesus say things like, my time is not yet come. But the crucifixion was Jesus' time. It was the time that God had set for the redemption of the world. And then with the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost came the opportunity to partake of those things. God's plan of redemption and redeeming his people is not some haphazard, thrown-together plan. His plan started before the foundation of the world, and it hasn't finished yet. Jesus tells us in John chapter 14 that there are other preparations being made for us now. God made plans for our redemption and Jesus, the gospel, and the opportunity to obey the gospel. But now Jesus tells us in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you into myself that where I am, there you may be also. What a powerful statement. God is still actively working, planning, preparing a place for us eternally in the heavens. As being joint heirs with Christ, as we mentioned in Romans 8, having the ability, having been uh, adopted into the family of God, we have been adopted into that family, and we cry, Abba, Father, praise be to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit for the redemption that has been brought to us through and by the planning of the ages. We're going to open it up to some questions here in just a moment, but before we do that, we'd like to close this morning with a prayer, if you bow with us. Our most kind of gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your watch care, your love and kindness upon us. We're thankful, Father, for all that has been done that we can have the opportunity uh, to believe in the things of your Son and to have the redemption which you have planned for us. We just pray, Father, that you would be with us, that you would watch over us. We who have been obedient to the gospel, Father, help us to understand your truth, understand the beauty of your salvation, the plan of that salvation. We pray, Father, that you would be with those who have not had the opportunity to hear the gospel, that the gospel may go, that they might hear the truth of your love for them. We pray, Father, that you would uh, also uh, be with those who've heard the gospel but have not yet been faithful to uh, its call. We pray, Father, that they might consider again your truth so when this life is over, all can have the hope of eternal life in heaven. We just pray, Father, that you be with those who are sick, afflicted, hurting, hungry. You know, there, there's just so much, Father. And we know, Father, that through you all things are possible. Bless us, Father, in your service. Keep us in your care, we pray in Jesus' name. 
<laughs> Thank you, Brother Brian Barrett, for you taking the class. It is our opportunity uh, to study the Word of God with you. And now is the time is asking the question. If you have any brothers and sisters, if you have any question, you are free to ask Brother Brian Barrett. He will he will answer for us. <clears throat> Can you turn on your microphone? Turn on your microphone, brothers. Brother, greetings, brother. Yes. We have much glad to brother. I don't have any questions. Love this session. Thank you, brother. Bro. Again, thank you for tuning in today. We we thank you for your attention and your uh, your ability to uh, to study and your desire to study. And we just pray that in this new year, God will bless you and. Uh, he will watch over you and care for you in such a way uh, that you can feel his blessings, see his blessings, and that you can live faithful. Uh, so that, uh, again, I one day when this life is over, look forward to seeing some of you on that other side, uh, all of you, uh, if you're faithful to him. Uh, and so we, we love you, we care for you, we want you uh, to have the very best. And if there's anything that we can teach you, any questions that you have, please contact Brother Stanley and he will get it organized. And uh, we will have lessons. We're going to finish redemption. Uh, we, we need some other subjects uh, coming later. And so if you have some other subjects or topics that you'd like to address, feel free to do so. In closing this evening, we wish to thank you again for spending your time and study with us. We hope the lesson has been uplifting and motivational. We encourage you to return again for our next lesson. Until then, may we invite you to visit our website. You will find many study opportunities. Our resource page has links to the Gospel Broadcasting Network, a 24-7 station with many great Christian programs and speakers. In Search of the Lord's Way, with Brother Phil Sanders. We have two links for Bibles and downloadable software. If you are looking to really expand your knowledge, perhaps you might like to try World Video Bible School, a college-level learning site free of charge. So, until next time, may God bless and keep you in His care as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the Churches of Christ salute you.